Good morning, guys. How are y'all doing? Hey, how cool is this that our leader can also play music and sing? And it's also awesome. It's intimidating for me to be the leader under him who has to do his job. <laughs> he probably could do it way better than me. So thank you for doing that, Scotty. You did awesome today. This team did awesome. But I am excited about uh, today, this week. Just losing an hour of sleep was not fun. But, uh, and then thinking, I know we had some teachers screaming about spring break. Well, some of us... Tomorrow's just another day, and, <laughs> and you know, uh, so looking forward to it, but I've been excited about this series. If, you were, uh, if you're new here, welcome. Um, my name's Andrew. I help with the worship team here, um, and I don't help with the smoke machine. Uh, and uh, if you're new here, we started a worship series called Express Yourself, and so the first sermon, uh, I spoke for the first time, and it was about surrendering our hearts, and just like... I want to be a part of my daughter's world. He wants to be a part of our worlds. Um, and then Micah sp- spoke last week about taking action with our time with God. And then what is done in private echoes in public. And I love that statement. You could tweet, do whatever. I don't, I don't even have Twitter, but you could do whatever with that. That's a great statement, Micah. Um, but it started, I started to ask myself, not that. Uh, I started to ask myself, if God simply wants our heart, and this is a relationship, and that's, that's our side of it, what is he delighted with? If this is a relationship and he's our father, you know, how can we display our worship to him in which his heart is delighted? And it was an awesome uh, question that I had, but I didn't know exactly how to answer. Um, and I, mean, I do view this as a relationship, and I do want to know what type of worship that he is delighted in. Um, but before we get into that, um, I wanted to share something with it's extremely uncomfortable for me and embarrassing, and I've debated if I should even share it or not. Um, I'm a certified personal trainer. Yeah, this dad bod having five head dude in front of you, I'm a personal trainer, certified and everything. I, I wasn't just a personal trainer, I worked for at the, one of the mecca of the meathead places to go in Austin, it was Metroflex Gym. And I worked there as the manager and one of the per, uh, personal instructors and stuff. Um, and I actually have proof, and I will show it quickly. Yeah, that was me. That, yeah. I know Angie's like, I'll miss those. I miss those right there. I miss those. And then I look like Jersey Shore. Look at this. I do miss that chin, though. Man. Miss that, but we got to get that because that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> what's funny, though, is um, I still remember everything. Uh, you know, and, and you're a walking billboard for yourself as a personal trainer, and we used to make fun of, poke fun at people who worked at Gold's Gym, and, and you were like, you know, like, you're a walking billboard. You got to look. You got, I, I want to hire what I want to look like. And so um, what's funny is I used to have this statement that Angie reminded me of when we were talking about this. I said to her, I will never be a has-been. This is the midst of that. I said, I will never be a has-been, and this, I'm going to look like this until my old age. Um, as you can tell, I'm eating my words and tacos and more than that, too. Um, but I realized that I'm not just like that. Um, with personal training, and I, yeah, I could sit down, and I could still talk and write diets, and I still have all the knowledge, but I, sim- I simply lack applying what I've learned and doing it consistently. And I heard us a, a quote the other day, or, or kind of, it was a write-up about our generation right now. And what's interesting about our generation is our generation has more access to books, knowledge, anything online than any generation before. And just to give you perspective, from the beginning of time till 2003, every book, every, anything that we had to document stuff and to look back on, we upload that amount of information every seven days. Yeah, that's books, YouTube videos, sermons, podcasts, pictures of cats and dogs, hopefully dogs. Um, <laughs> you know, um, that's our generation. They're saying our generation has access. If I want to learn a new language, instantly I can start doing it. If I want a new hobby, I can instantly move into that direction and start looking up how to do it. Um, and I love YouTube, and so I'll do that. Um, but they said the Achilles heel of our generation, though, is our generation is obsessed with learning. 
but we lack applying what we've learned. And it's true. I mean, if I think of that's all of us in this room that are alive today, I think if we all think about it, there's many stuff like me with personal training or you with something else. We're quick to learn. We love learning. But um, we lack applying what we've actually learned. And I started to think about this. I'm not like this with just personal training. I'm like this with my relationship with God. Um, I love hearing certain scriptures. There's certain scriptures that are just motivating and you could get them tattooed and it pumps you up and people's on cars. But then there's some scriptures that sting when I read them. Like, they don't sit well with Andrew. And Andrew doesn't know, I don't know what to do, it's a little uncomfortable, but we're going to sit in this uncomfortableness together this morning. So um, I wanted to direct to James 1.22, and James was the brother of Jesus. And he says to this church, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is a like who look, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself with the boogers, with the nose hairs, needing a trim up, hairs looking messy, slept wrong, and he at once forgets what he looks like and does nothing about it. But the one who looks into the perfect law, which is the Bible, when you hear that, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And it says, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, Andrew, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Ouch. I know I struggle with that one. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained, unstained from the world. And I think he was just giving us an example right there because uh, we need an example of the stuff that he finds, he's delighted in it, stuff that motivates him and he's, he finds attractive in us. It's not just orphans and widows. We can look at that. It's, I really think he's talking about people in need who need help, who need somebody to come in, who need a savior. But it made me start to think, um, I, I think I'm, it's kind of like being a fan. Um, we can know stats of an athlete, an actor. We know how many times Jennifer Anderson's been married. We, we know um, every detail about some sports and athletes, where they went to college, where they played at, um, what their hobbies are. But what's funny is if you walked up to that person that you know so much about, and they're having dinner with their wife or their spouse, and you approached them feeling like you know them personally, they'd have no clue who you were. And it would make for an awkward conversation for them. You would leave excited and wouldn't even care and be like, hey, you know who I met? Yeah, that yeah, was awesome. And they're over there going like, sorry, babe, this, you know, I didn't know that was going to happen. But I started to think, do we tend to do that with our relationship with God? Are we obsessed with learning and we love being challenged? But are we becoming fans or are we becoming followers? Because if I'm honest... I think this is something that I've struggled with. I sure love learning about the Bible. I sure love coming into church every Sunday. I love being challenged. Oh, I love convicting sermons. But what do I do with that? I think if we're going to follow what he did, and if we're going to look at Jesus, which essentially was God in a bod, and Jesus would, came down to earth and he started being missional and reaching people, it seems like Jesus' uh, simple action was go, not learn. And what's funny is we get so caught up in these sermons and scriptures, and we, um, we won't make a move unless it aligns with what Paul's called us to do. We won't do nothing. But what's funny is the very people we're so obsessed with learning about didn't have that story of themselves to go off of. They had Jesus' action of go, and that was it. They had the Old Testament and Jesus' action to go. And so it's, it's, it's coming clear to me that where I lack is I need to be following what his actions were. What was he doing? 
And some of you are going like, I thought this was about worship. Well, what does this have to do with worship at BCC? That was a question that I was asking myself. I was like, this is, don't just dive into this, and your whole mission was talk about worship. Um, and so I was like, okay, we've, we looked at James. Where else could we look? Well, Paul writes to the modern church in Romans, and he says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Do y'all, can y'all see that? Which is your spiritual worship? It seems to me that what he's delighted in, in my act of worship, is using my body and time and resources. That is my act of spiritual worship to God. And that's something that fires him up. And I don't know if you're like me. Um, Angie said this to me so many times, and it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it, it's rough to hear it. She said, Andrew, you're a schmoozer. You're a smooth talker. You sure know how to talk, talk. You know how like to talk. And in essence, she's right. She would say to me, I love, I, 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 you know, some women starve for that. She said, I've got an abundance of it. And I don't just listen to you. I watch your actions to see if your actions say you love me, you know, because you're quick to just tell me. And I listened to this man named uh, Ed Milet. He's a businessman. He's a Christian. Uh, he, but just his videos are motivational, inspirational. You'll feel challenged. And uh, I started sharing them with some friends, and I just love listening to them. But he said a statement that just, it rocked me. I heard it and I thought, um, this is so true for not just me, but a lot of us. He says this statement, I can't hear a word you are saying because your actions speak so loudly. And I've actually started viewing my actions in the thinking of that now. I literally will view what I'm doing and what I'm saying now because that honestly convicted me. The schmoozer, yeah, that convicted me. And so it started convicting me too about my walk with God. I feel like, um, I think we've been obsessed about learning and growing in our relationship with him and it seems to me that growing in our relationship with him is is following what he's called us to do. And I'm sorry if this ruffles any feathers. I do think we've gotten a little too obsessed with church and not what the church was for. And so if you've been at BCC for at any point in time, you've heard this statement, 16,000. 16,000 people. And if you don't know about that, there's about 20,000 people here in Brownwood. And there was a survey sent out to people, and in this survey, they asked questions, but one of the questions was, are you involved with the local church or community? And 16,000 people out of 20,000, plus or minus, responded with no. They're not involved with a community or a church. And that kept this man up at night and his wife. Because it seems we have an overabundance of churches here. I mean, I can go down the street and go, you could right now go attend another church if you don't like this. A lot of flavors to try. But there's some gap if we're 20,000 people in this area and 16,000 are not involved and may not even want to have tried it, maybe don't want to be a part of it. And so I started asking these questions, though. You know, have we started... Using that as a cute statement, 16,000. Is that something that we like to use and we'll put on shirts and stuff, but what are we going to do about that? And I started asking Scotty. I said, Scotty, what, how are we going to meet the 16,000? And he said, Andrew, and this is him being transparent with me, 
I don't know, I just followed the nudge that God called me to plant a church that was going to be a mission for those people. I don't know how exactly it's all, I don't know how the steps, I don't know how it's going to be outlined, I don't know how exactly to do it, but I know that if this church doesn't start and it doesn't exist that way, then I don't want to be part of another church around here like that. And um, we started talking and I said, and the conclusion we came up with what hit the nail on the head is, how are we, going to reach the, how are, how are we as a church going to meet and reach the 16,000? How is BCC going to reach the 16,000 and not just talk about it? Through you. Through you. I think we've, we do over-glamorize. We can say like, oh, we've got to do this missional thing over here. and We've got to do this, which is great. And if God's nudging in your heart, please act on that. We need that. But there's also little nudges you've been getting in day-to-day life, I know I have, that I overlook because they're a little uncomfortable for me. Talking to someone I work with, um, um, the, my neighbors, do I even know their names? Um, do I use my house as an escape, or am I missional with it? Do I use it for his, do I escape into it and escape from the world, or am I missional with it? And I think there's so many nudges we've been getting, and each and every one of those nudges is how we are going to meet and reach the 16,000. And it will start, we will have projects, we'll have communities, and if you feel like it's, you've been pushed to do something, then step out and, and say to Scotty, I will, I'm going to warn you though, if you step out, we're not here for ideas. If you step out, be prepared to step out and lead. Um, and that's scary. Um, and that's something that scares me really bad, because... Um, I'm task-oriented. Um, I work at Dell, and I make things, I make things happen. Uh, I get my t- stuff done, and I focus on my next thing. And if you're like me, when I hear this type of message, I get a, a little bit of anxiety. Because I feel like there's another thing just added on my plate. And it, it, it makes me uncomfortable. But I thought... I don't want to just talk to this certain people who are, if we're honest with yourself, you think, okay, I think I have been a little bit of a fan. I wanted to talk to the side of the room who have stepped out too. Because I feel like we step out, and there's times where you step out, and it's not as fun in, at times. It's, it loses its sexiness. Like, you step out, it was fun, like, <laughs> oh! And we're dealing with personalities, and time, and I got a full-time job, and you got a full-time job, and... I just don't feel like it today. You know, it was a hard week. Um, And so my question I was asking myself is, what do you do when you've stepped out in faith and it's become challenging? What what do you do? I wanted to share with you guys an example. Um, I was reminded of this when I was thinking through this, and I didn't even know it was going to be an example. Last Sunday, we were doing worship, and... I had had a crazy work week, Um, busy, hard, um, stuff, home stuff going on. And Sunday he was here before I knew knew it. And I'm thinking, I'm expected to come up here and encourage and motivate this team so they can encourage and motivate you guys. And I don't even feel encouraged or motivated right now. I'm tired. I didn't feel like I was in the mood for it today, last Sunday. And I won't forget, we were singing Have It All. And I heard myself saying these words. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world, take this heart and breathe in this this heart that now is yours. I probably just jacked that up, but you got what I'm saying. Um, And I thought, am I just singing this? Or do I believe in this? Because it seems like I'm just singing it this morning. And so in that moment, I didn't know what to do. I just raised my hand, and I remember I was like, I have to close my eyes, because if I look around, I'm going to be distracted and not be focused. And I was like, I just got to close my eyes and raise my hand, and I literally said this. God, can you turn my eyes and my heart on you right now? I feel distracted. I feel overwhelmed. (laughs) I just don't feel in the mood. God, can you help me remind me, remind me of you and what you're doing in my life and in this church? Can you help focus me, God? Can you help me believe what I'm saying? And I instantly felt like I took action and my heart followed. 
I was instantly reminded of why we're doing this. I instantly was motivated and encouraged and felt I, could, I wanted to worship then. I didn't want it to stop. It was like, we're at the last song now. No, I just got started. Uh, and I, I've even asked this question to Scotty and asked if I could use this uh, um, reference, but you may have seen Scotty even get on his knees a couple of times and, and during worship. And I asked him, you know, is this something where you feel like physical, spiritual, like Holy Spirit's pushing you down? And you're like, oh, okay, I'm on my knees, you know. Or is this something you're like, no, this is surrender. And I'm doing what I know I should do this moment. And I can't do this without God. And he said, that's exactly it. And what's funny is, and you can ask Scotty, and I can attest to it now, as soon as you do it in those moments, you instantly are reminded and feel like your heart followed my action, I took action and did what I knew I should have done, and my heart followed. What's funny is we talk about faith a lot. Our faith, faith, we talk, faith is a buzzword in the church community. But what's funny is the very thing that faith is, is stepping out of things out of your control. If it was in your control, it would not be called faith. And that is something that I started asking myself. It's challenging, it's exciting at first, but it's challenging when you follow that nudge and you do step out into faith out of your control. But then I was reminded of something like this. Why do we do these studies? Why do we, do, why do we listen to the Bible or, or go do Bible studies with each other? Or why do we learn? What, what's the learning for? Well, that is when you have stepped out. That is when you can lean on your knowledge. Because it's told you what you should do in those moments. It's reminding of you of what you're called to do. Now is when we can leave on, lean our knowledge. But I feel like we've got it vice versa. We, we love the knowledge. We crave the knowledge. Oh, how we love conviction. But what would it look like if we changed the word conviction into action? And so if you are one of those people this morning and you're saying like, I've stepped out, and if I'm being honest, it's been hard. Well, now is the time you lean on your knowledge and do what you know you should do, and take action on what you should do, and your heart will follow. And if that's you this this, this morning like it has been to me, just keep persevering. That's what it literally said that in Romans 12, 1, keep persevering, persevering on the law of liberty. But what about the people, and I'm not going to make us raise hands, this is going to be a you know, raise hands, um, Steve Harvey show, or get the audience engaged. I'm just going to ask you a question. Have I becoming, have I been a fan? Or have I been a follower? Because if I'm honest with myself and we're going to be real, I think I've become a fan. And I think, I think I have been in love with the idea of doing church and forgot what the church was for. And so if that's you, my question is, what has God been placing on your heart that you need to act on? Um, and don't, don't, don't over-glamorize it. And don't just shoot it under the rug if you think it's not, it doesn't match somebody else's actions or whatever somebody else feels a nudge on. Just act on it. Um, and then I was thinking that, and I thought, I wish I had like an example of what to do, like a real example, because sometimes talking, like we said Talking is just talking, but what, what do we follow? Well, I'm going to give you some examples this morning. You're actually sitting next to people who have stepped out in faith. This room is f- filled with people who have stepped out in faith. And he doesn't like to look like the hero, but I'm going to talk about you, Scotty. When he'd heard that statement, the 16,000, imagine this. Imagine having your two dream jobs. Your kids are doing good. Things are going great. Got a great, my grandparents are involved. Things are going great. But then you hear this, and it just, something starts tearing you up inside, like, this isn't right. And you don't know what it's going to look like. You don't have the the results. You don't have the picture and say, oh, we'll be fine. I made it. Like, we're going to make it. You have no clue how it's going to happen or what's going to happen or what you need to do. All you need to know is, I need to do something about this. And he took action. And if it wasn't for you doing this, Scotty, 
these people would not be here today. I wouldn't be here today. I, had no, I did not know you before this. And so I'm saying thank you to you and Emily. Thank you to your sons, Tim and Seth. Thank you for stepping out in faith, not knowing what it's going to look like, but saying, I'll go. I'll be a follower. I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow this nudge. And I'm scared, but I'm going to lean and know what I should do and do it. So thank you. Another person I want to bring up to, two people, don't feel like they're heroes either, is Micah and Ashley, James. Um, a while back, we had went to Red Gap Brewery in Cisco. And so it was a slow night, and we got the pleasure of talking with one of the owners. Come to find out, they're in leadership too at a big church in Dallas. Um, and just like we had read in Draw the Circle, the book, they wanted a place like Ebenezer's Coffee House where people could come, connections could be made, people could do life together, and just conversations happen. But they wanted, they started with a brewery, but they didn't want it to be a place for just people to, you know, drink, and it turned into a bar situation. They wanted an environment where both the unchurched and the church felt welcome to come in and sit across from each other and have connections we made and conversations they had. And we left that night, and it was just a normal night for me. But Micah left and Ashley left with a conviction. Brown needs that. Brown needs something like that. And they haven't even, they, they've started the process. They've written some checks that honestly probably can't cash right now. Because they want that for Brown and they've stepped out and now Red Gap is getting started and it's going to be a place for that. And it's probably going to ruffle some church feathers. You know, you, you work at a church and you're doing this? Yeah, yeah, I am. And we are and we will. And they've stepped out. And it's scary. I'm sure you can ask. I've talked to Micah. He's in the midst of the paperwork process, and he, they've written some checks. It is scary right now. And he has no clue if this is going to work out, if it's going to happen, but he's stepped out and followed that nudge. I also want to talk about somebody else to you this morning. It's Jerry and Stephanie Adamez. Jerry and Stephanie Adam- Adamez are not here this morning, but when we first launched the church and we started community groups, they, sh- they came. And he said, I was so scared to come to these because my knowledge of the Bible is not very deep. And I'm intimidated being right next to Christian people who get real deep into it, and I don't know what to say. And he said, you guys are just like me. And I felt so relaxed. Like, I felt like family. And then as he was attending this group, they started to feel like, we need to do this. We need to start a community group. And you know how hard it is? I don't think you guys understand. Some of you are about to find out today. It is hard to open up the very place that you try to escape the world from and invite people to come into it. You start to feel like, I can't escape. <laughs> They're here too, you know? And then when stuff starts breaking, you know, spills happen, you definitely start questioning if this is the right thing you're supposed to do or not. But they've started a group, and it's been successful, and they're making changes and big things happen in their community together. And I'm proud of them for that. And I want to say thank you to them. Thank you to the other people who have stepped out too. Thank you guys. Thank you. And then also last, um, I don't think, I think we don't really think about this, but this church is volunteer basis. I have a full-time job. Monday's coming tomorrow just like it is for you. And I don't want it to happen. Everybody on this team, the people you see serving back there, the very people that you dropped your kids off to, have a full-time job and are serving and trying to make this happen for you guys to come in and have a great experience and to feel like you got a glimpse of what God's doing in your life or got a glimpse of God being there, that he does love you, that he hasn't. They're just trying to usher in that, and we've all stepped out. I'm preaching for the second time, and it's scary. It's way easier to hide behind a guitar. Um, but we're filled with people who've taken a nudge. And yes, we can talk about missionary work. And thank you if you are a missionary. Thank you for doing that. But I think we've also sh- scooted under the rug the little stuff that we deem little. But in God's eyes, it's huge. Which is stepping out, not knowing what it's going to look like, and trying to serve and, do, and follow a nudge God's doing in your life. Because it sounds like to me, if I'm reading through Romans 12, 
that our acts of spiritual worship is presenting our bodies, time, and resources. And that's what fires him up and pumps him up. And if he's talking about spiritual worship, it sounds like we've all been called to be worship leaders. Not just me, not just Micah, not just Tim, Scotty, all of us have been called to be worship leaders. We have all been called to be worship leaders for our city. What if there was a church that did step on a little bit of church toes, but simply just followed what God was leading them to do in their community, in each other's lives? What if? What if, guys? Is 16,000 going to be a cute statement for us, or is it going to be a mission for us? Are we going to be a cruise ship church where we come in and you sit where you get and you got your coffee and I enjoy the worship, love the worship? Are we going to be a battleship where we come in and this is like a locker room talk and it's game time on Monday? Because I believe that's, that's how we're going to do it. If we're going to be followers and not fans, we have to be like that. And like I said... I'm not out excluded from this. I'm not saying that I've perfected it and I, so I get to speak about it. This convicted me so bad and it scares me really bad. Um, but I'm tired of being a fan. I'm tired of being obsessive about learning and going deep and setting up. I'm not trying, I love Bible studies and stuff so please don't, don't say I'm not into that stuff but there has to be a difference. It's kind of like your actions are speaking so loudly and what are they saying to people? What is our church saying to people? What are you saying to the people you live and work with? And so I want to leave you guys. I know this is a convicting sermon. It is for me. You can tell what's convicting. I heard this from Stephen Furtick. When the room's quiet. <laughs> and it's quiet this morning. Um, but I'm right here with you guys. It, it, this, is a, this is a hard one to hear. But it's what we need to hear right now. And we need to do something about it. And I also want to tell you for the people, if you're coming in and you drop off your kids and you kind of continue on, let's do better. If we're a family, we're not just going to be a church and we're a family. Hey, just say something encouraging to them. Say, hey, thank you for doing this. Um, this means a lot to me. I see Christ displayed through you. I see Christ in you. When you're doing that, it reminds me of Christ and following Christ. And so thank you for doing that. You never know. That could be one of those Sundays where it's been challenging and they were this close to starting to question stepping back. And so, I'm going to challenge you guys, if you're coming in, follow that nudge, whatever it is. Don't, don't try to make it some big ordeal. Unless that's what he's putting on your plate, then fine. And I'm good luck with that one. <laughs> but, follow it. And if you're coming in today, and it's been hard, if we're honest, now is when we lean on that knowledge. And let's be a family of people who are not just encouraging, motivating, and challenging each other, but we're missional and we're going out to the city and people we love and we're meeting and reaching that 16,000. What if we did that? So thank you, Scotty. Thank you for starting this, man. I'm proud of you. I think we overlooked that. I'm sorry. But I want to encourage you guys. Let's just, I'm going to pray. Just simply act on whatever, whatever it is this week. Whatever it's been, just act on it. And don't feel like this burden. And <laughs> like, I feel like a horrible piece of crap now. Like, no. <laughs> Golly. If my kid did that, I'd be like, no, you're not getting it. Just try, try, do something. So don't be like that, guys. Let's just continue on. This is going to be exciting. We're ending the series next week. And we're singing about singing a new song, and, and Micah's going to be preaching. And w w I think we're going to talk and highlight on the aspects of community worship and singing a new song together. And that's exciting for me. And then we're going to move into community, talking about community. And then it's Easter Sunday. It's going to be fun, guys. We have some fun stuff planned. But it isn't going to come without its challenges. But we're going to do it. Right, Scotty? Yeah. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for what you're doing in this church and in these people's life. God, help turn our eyes back on you. Help refocus our hearts. 
Help us hear and see when you're leading us and the nudges. Help us follow them, God, but also help give us the strength and courage when it's become challenging. Help us reminding, remind us that you're there, that you have us in your hands and you're making a way and you didn't leave us. And you're there in that moment as well. Thank you, God, for what you're doing this church. And thank you for, the, for those of the people t- today that get to go have spring break tomorrow. I'm a little jealous. Uh, amen.